You're on. Hey guys, uh, this is Farmer Keith from Mercy Med. Excited to be joining everybody today. Um, we'll give time for people to hop on. Uh, but I wanted to first ask the question, um, and you can think about this uh, right now. What have you actually grown and eaten? And what do you enjoy to grow yourself and eat yourself? Uh, just think about taste and uh, the funness, the fun of picking it off the vine, uh, whatever it is. Just let us know, comment um in that comment section and tell us what what you like and what you like to grow um but today's going to be a day of talking about what we're doing at mercy Mar mercy med why we're doing it uh a few things about how we do it kind of the philosophy behind it and the structure behind it um, i'm going to talk about potting soil amendments uh soil health um one of the things that i tell everybody uh that ask about what we're growing at mercy med is um, they ask how do you get plants that look good and are healthy and vegetables that are healthy. I think that the first thing we have to do is step back from thinking about just growing plants and you have to think about growing soil as well because the foundation of the plant is the soil just like the foundation of our body is the plant and the vegetable. Um, so I always want to link um, what we're doing, the mission of Mercy Med, um, it, the mission of Mercy Med is to help people have access and affordability to healthy food. Um, and the, the plant, we need to give access and um, give it good soil as well. So there's kind of parallels that we can draw uh, from the plants to our lives and it's all a cycle. So uh, today we're gonna dive into uh, just what we're doing and some questions. Um, do we have any questions yet? So far, Teresa said that she has grown cherry tomatoes. Cherry it was tomatoes. like, Pure candy, warm off yeah. the vine. Yeah, no joke. I love, love cherry tomatoes. Sun, we grow sun golds, uh, sun golds here, but there are so many fun varieties of heirloom cherry tomatoes and uh, purple bumblebees and just all these fun varieties. Uh, I love uh, canning them, uh, canning the tomatoes and eating them in the winter, um, putting putting them on uh, meals when usually you don't have tomatoes. But yeah, cherry tomatoes are awesome. Um, but keep thinking about fun, fun vegetables that you grow. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the foundation of exactly what we're using to start the plants in the greenhouse. Let me show you the greenhouse right here. Um, this is where we start our plants. Um, it's, a, it's a good mechanism for uh, isolating and creating. Uh, maybe during January, you can start uh, even something like tomatoes. If you have a heater, you have good airflow, you have watering system, you can make a little microclimate um, and you don't have to have something this big, um, and you can also have something bigger if you want to do plant cells. Um, but you it can you can do anything from a shoe rack that you drape plastic over so that you can keep the humidity right and the temperature right. Um, so the, it doesn't need to be this big, but something maybe just as big as a shoe rack size that you can actually put soil in a pot, put a seed in a pot, and control the heat. And Roxanne says hello. Hey Roxanne, it's good to good to talk to you. So this is the soil that I use. It's an organic potting soil from the coast of Maine. Um, I trust this brand, Coast of Maine. They just have amazing products. Um, and uh, I use a few different types of potting soil um, from them. And uh, I learned, because I worked at Jenny Jack Farms, which is a farm in Pine Mountain. And if you haven't bought from them, they're amazing. Uh, highest quality people with the highest quality food as well. Uh, and they really take care of the land that they're on, which is so important. Um, but I use this. And I use a few a few amendments, but this is the main one that I choose to use. Um, Symphony or Harmony are two, two types of chicken manure. Um, so we think about chicken manure, and there's a whole cycle uh, to planting. You have to have the animal as well. And if it was my choice and we were in the middle, uh, we were allowed to have chickens and cows out in the middle of the city, we'd have cow manure, chicken manure fresh that we could compost. But until then, um, having to buy chicken manure um, from a company uh, to actually add the minerals to the ground, to the soil. Um, and I want to show everybody this. You can look at these numbers right here. Um, if anybody's not familiar with the numbers, uh, they stand for nitrogen, or, yeah, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, so you, you, what you want, uh, if you want a leafy green plant, you want nitrogen. Nitrogen makes things leafy. It's the quality um, the really good quality green. Uh, phosphorus helps plants take up minerals, 
It helps them have good root structures. Um, so phosphorus is also important. And then potassium makes plants fruit. So things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, all those summer things that you think about that flower and then put off a fruit or put off a tomato or whatever uh, type of uh, fruit off the plant. That's uh, what, where potassium comes in. So with tomato plants, you may want a little less, uh, less nitrogen and more potassium uh, and more phosphorus. Anna and Evelyn say hello. Hey Anna and Evelyn. That's my wife and daughter. But yeah, so, um, it, so we're just here to make sure that we have uh, a really good uh, variety of, uh, so of uh, these minerals. There are other trace minerals that are in the soil that are really important. Um, like anything, anything from, you have to have the right amount of magnesium and calcium. This actually has 9% nine, 9 calcium. So you have to think about those. But the main thing is if it's leafy and green, you want more nitrogen. If it's fruiting like a tomato or any of those fruiting plants, you want to have more phosphorus and potassium. Um, so we had a question about mulch. Could you tell us like the purpose of mulch and what you would use to mulch? So mulch is really good for a few things. Um, I use a, a few a few different ways to mulch. You can use landscape fabric to block out weeds and uh, retain water. You can use wood chips. You can use hay. Um, you can use, I mean, pine straw if you want. Um, but mulch does a really good job of suppressing weeds um, and holding in water retention. Um, it retains water so the sun's not directly baking the soil. Um, soil's main prerogative, what it wants to do is be covered at all times. If you look at a forest, things are always growing up from the soil so the sun isn't baking the top layer of soil because if, if the sun hits it and bakes all that water out, then life can't exist without that water. So we mulch so that we have better water retention so that uh, the sun's hitting the hay, which is what I use, uh, good quality um, hay that doesn't have uh, weed seeds and you have to make sure that you know the farmer that produced the wheat, the uh, hay. Um, I, I sometimes when I'm in a pinch, I use BW Caps, uh, which is in Phoenix City. Uh, they have really good quality hay if I can't get it from an organic uh, producer. Um, so if Nicole needs just a little bit of mulch, yeah, so what do you think she should do? So if you have a little bit of mulch, I would use, uh, I would go down to BW Caps um, and get their hay. It was really good. It, uh, it, after a year, it'll integrate into your soil um, and just add more uh, carbon to your soil. So if you just have, have one of a few plants, I would just surround them with quality hay um, or wood chips. Wood chips is a cheaper um, option, but a lot of times if you get those, you get them in bulk. As you can see on the ground right here, uh, I have wood chips down for the walking area. Um, so yeah, so uh, you can use wood chips, which is really good. You do have to worry with wood chips. A lot of times when you put them down, you'll have some mold that the tree had on it that the wood chips came from. Slugs also really like a wood chip, so you may have some slug problems if it's really moist, if it's kept moist. Uh, so there are there are benefits with each time the mulch. And you can also see over here, we'll walk over here. Um, and our friend Calvin is with us today as well. I'm gonna say, hey Calvin, this is Facebook Live. Calvin lives across the street. But yeah. Uh, so this is the, um, this right here is the uh, landscape fabric I use just around the outside. And it also is a form of mulch because it, uh, no weeds unless it is nutgrass. Nutgrass will go through it. Nutgrass is crazy. Um, but this is suppressed weeds and it retains water. Uh, so you'll see a lot of farms that actually put this over the rows and burn holes uh, in and maybe plant strawberries or whatever so they don't have to weed as much and to retain that water. Okay. Any, any other questions right now? So we've got someone who is having trouble because bugs are eating their beans and their basil. Yeah, yeah. So um, the best thing, and this is why we don't grow plants, we grow soil. Um, really good quality soil is the best way that you can, uh, is the best way you can fight, fight bugs because good soil creates good plants. And when a bug, a pest, a squash bug, a hornworm, comes in they go for the weakest plant first so a lot of times you have you may have to sacrifice a weak plant not use pesticides um not spray anything on your plant uh unless it's an organic pesticide we have we do use a few organic pesticides um or insecticides but uh you good soil is the number one way uh to create um pest-free environments but 
I've had, I've lost a little bit to uh, squash bugs. You can't get rid of squash bugs. Neem oil doesn't work. Uh, nematodes, all that. It, it may put it off for a little bit, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, kill anything off. So you may have to fa sacrifice a few plants, but um, good healthy soil, get compost. That is a rich cow manure, horse manure uh, compost um, is the way to go to ensure that you have really good soil. So now, how do we know if we have good so soil? Because Carolina wanted to know, should I get my soil tested? What's the benefits yeah. of soil testing? What does it tell us? What types are there? Who does soil testing? Mm -hmm. So you can uh, get just a normal packet of soil testing that gives you the potassium, phosphorus, nitrogen, and a few trace minerals. Um, you can get a packet of that from uh, Home Depot, BW Caps, Lowe's, uh, any hardware store usually will sell a soil testing kit so that you can know the basics. I personally get ours done at the uh, UGA Extension office. Uh, it's the University of Georgia ex Farm Extension and they're there to help anybody who's in agriculture, even home farmers. Uh, you can pay and get metal poisonings. If you're scared that you may have poisoning in your soil from like cadmium to zinc to uh, whatever metal it is, iron poisoning, you can uh, get your soil test to, and go there and ask for poisoning and then your basic uh, home gardener test. Um, so really, if you want to get it in depth and good quality, go to the UGA Extension office. Um, they're, they're really great. That's who we use. Or if you want uh, cheap means, quick, um, you can do it really fast. You can go get one of those home tests from Lowe's or Home Depot or BW Caps. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, so any let, more questions right now? Let's see what's growing. Yeah, so we'll go. Uh, so let's go up to the tomatoes first. Um, we'll walk in the 2000. And I use this 2000 um, because it has UV, UV protection. So it keeps out a lot of harsh light. And it also allows me to control the water which is really important when you're looking at diseases of the plants because tomato, what's gonna to kill them off a lot of times is early leaf blight. If those leaves are touching the ground, touching the soil, um, it can create some blight and disease. Powdery mildew, um, those are things that we're trying to limit. And if I can keep good airflow and limit the amount of moisture that stays on the leaf, I can control a lot of the disease. So you can look in here, They're so pretty. So we got the first few tomatoes coming in, um, but I'm pruning these heavily, um, and I have this drip irrigation. So rain is not falling directly on it, getting the leaves wet, and then them staying wet. Um, I've got it pruned so there's good airflow through. It's not bunched up. Every every Monday and Thursday, I come in here and prune heavily, or Monday, Wednesday, uh, and maybe on a weekend, I prune. Make sure there's no suckers coming off the plant, bulking it up. And then I control how much water from the bottom um, is, is actually getting to the root of the plant to keep this alive. So good airflow is really important. And also uh, being able to control the water from the base and maybe not have a lot of times with these summer things that uh, like peppers, uh, cucumbers, there are a lot of diseases that get to them and not having overhead sprinkler systems can really help you actually have a plant that lasts the entire summer um, and can produce all year. All right, so if I have a tomato plant and I put it in a pot, how should I plant it? So if you have a tomato plant, and we may need to really zoom in on this, um, you, you want to plant it to where the growth point is, maybe one leaf up from the growth point. Is there a small one? Yeah, let's look at this one back here. Let's go to this one. So this is a All plant right. died. Show and tell, tiny little tomato. Here yeah, we go. A plant died right here, so I had to replant. Um, and on this plant, I had it lower, but there are little fibers all along this plant. And all of those are actually roots. So as these tomato plants aren't meant to grow up, they're meant to sprawl out just nature designs them to sprawl and they keep rooting in the ground. So as this stem touches the ground, these the little hairs, these little fiber hairs will root in and turn into giant roots. So you actually want to plant this plant to that growth point so that if I want, even wanted to, I could push up the soil all next to that, almost to the very top. 
and all those hairs will root in oh. and, and bring up more more minerals, more water, um, and can help. That can actually cause the difference between a plant that stays alive and one that can't can't weather. So the basically, the stem turns into roots. Yeah, the, the stem fibers turn into roots. That's right. Oh. Um, so that's one really good way uh, to plant. You almost want to plant that tomato as deep as you can, as long as you're not covering up the top of it. Um, wow. And then once they start getting taller, uh, up to the ones down down the road over here, we'll actually start pruning the bottom leaves so that none of the leaves are touching the soil. Because there's a lot of soil-based diseases that will get your tomatoes. Um, okay. And, uh, and when you say pruning, like, we just snip them off or tear them off? Or? You can... One, you can uh, from the stem, very close to the actual stem, you can get little pruners and cut them. And usually I bring a little alcohol wipes or I use something called Sanidate and I'll wipe the snippers every time I use them so I'm not passively passing a disease from one plant to the next to the next. Because you can actually like transplant diseases from one plant if you keep using the same snippers. Um, okay, so if I have, let's say three tomato plants, how long is that gonna take me? If you have three tomato plants, I would think uh, if you're starting them from seed, I'd go 90, uh, somewhere between 70, 70 and 90 days before you start getting good food. All right, if I go to Home Depot, grab a three plants, okay. take them home. Yeah, you can, in a month, if you if you get, go to Home Depot and you get a plant about yay tall uh, from the soil, in, a, in about one month, if you plant it and it, those roots take in, it'll take about five days for the roots to get structured. You may have to baby it a little bit until the roots take off into the soil um and then probably one month from planting that you'll have tomatoes Ooh! yeah it takes about a month and a half to actually go from seed to uh a foot tall plant and then from a foot tall plant up into uh to fruiting takes about a month so how many tomatoes can a plant make you can have it depends on the variety of tomato plant um if you have a determinate variety versus indeterminate one that keeps growing, you can have fruit, you can grow it for one full year, 12 months, if you have the right environment. But usually you'll have from um, from May, it'll start fruiting in May, and you'll have until early October. Um, but one tomato plant can put off hundreds and hundreds of tomatoes. Ooh. If, if, you, if you have them pruned right, if you have them, uh, able to fight disease really well and stay alive, you can have um, 50, 50, probably 50 to 100 on uh, a high yielding variety plant. Nice. Yeah. Cool. We'll probably, hopefully from each of these, we'll pull off uh, five a week. Five or more than that if, uh, if we get it all right and keep them alive. Um, but that's a lot. If we have 45 plants, 30 to 40 plants in a row, uh, five tomatoes each is is going to be a lot of tomatoes. Nice. Yep. Yeah, do we have any more questions right now? Not now, but you could re-ask the question and see if anyone else has ever grown something and eaten it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, if anybody's comment below, tell us what you've grown, what you love to grow, what you, uh, how it tasted, what was the difference in uh, buying from the store versus just picking it off the vine and eating it right there. Like, just coming up to this cucumber, there's something about it. Taking that cucumber and just taking a bite out of it as fresh as possible. Just tell us some experiences that you have growing your own food. Um, and we'll, I'll show you this lettuce as well because a lot of people love growing lettuce. Um, it's something that every night we kind of, uh, our family tries to eat. Um, we like to eat a salad with every meal. Uh, so we, a lot of people just maybe have a three foot by eight foot bed that you just grow lettuce in for your salads every night. Um, so this is our lettuce row. And you look down, I'm, I'm actually converting this into a pepper row uh, slowly. So these are little peppers. So I've harvested up until right here. Um, and I'm gonna keep harvesting. I kind of harvest intermittently and I planted peppers behind it. But these, uh, these are some butterhead lettuce varieties. Uh, and in Columbus, it's so hot, you may want to get a heat tolerant, something that it says on the package, it can take on, take a lot of heat and not get bitter. Um, but you can pack in a lot of lettuce um, in, into a small space and grow a lot of it. Uh, it's kind of one of the most highest 
uh, value in producing uh, foods and it needs a lot of that nitrogen, uh, good nitrogen soil and you can keep pumping them out really fast. So if I have containers, will my lettuces do okay in containers? Yeah, you can, you can grow a lot of lettuce in containers even on like a balcony. If you just have an apartment and you want to grow lettuce on, on a uh, balcony that may get 50% sunlight, uh, 50 to 70 percent sunlight you can even make it a, a dent in your a lettuce buying habits at the grocery store just with a balcony 10 uh, maybe 10 pots on it and you can grow uh, depending on how big the pots are but, but just in this row right here you can see this row i grow every six inches every square six inches i have a plant oh so, so they only need about six inch square yeah six inch square so if you have a pot um yeah, you, you can grow a while a little and it gets bunched up, but it'll keep growing. So every six inches, I have probably in this row 380 80 lettuce plants just in this row. Oh, wow. That's a lot of lettuce. So if you just have a pot that's this size, you can grow five lettuce heads right there and keep growing them. So 10 pots, five lettuce heads that big. You can have lettuce every night of the week and then get a second cutting. Um, but yeah, I always encourage people kind of the gateway um, vegetable grower growing uh, vegetable is carrots and lettuce oh um, I, I think that they're pretty easy to grow um, it can be a little difficult with what varieties of lettuce if you grow romaine versus butterhead there are some a few hard harder varieties of lettuce to grow but um, they're kind of you use them a lot it's just so much fun to know that your salad is you produced it Hmm. Um, the bulk of it so so Gina she tried growing cucumbers years ago mm -hmm. and she'd like to try it again but she was disappointed because they were so small yeah. and she wants to know like what she could do differently yeah first off hey Gina um, second off the, the a lot of times when you get uh, cucumbers you have to have a pollinator so you need to make sure that uh, you see little bees flying around if you don't want to self pollinate um, but it takes a lot of phosphorus, like I was talking about earlier. Phosphorus is what helps the plant take up minerals. Um, and then potassium makes them fruit. Uh, usually, a lot of times if you have uh, suspect or low potassium levels, you're going to have smaller fruit, not as good quality fruit. Um, a lot of times when I've messed up with cucumbers as well in the past, it's been because I've left them in my greenhouse too long. Um, and then I didn't have uh, my cucumbers kind of solidified in the greenhouse and then I moved them out in the field and they were already flowering and then they were kind of confused about do we take roots to the ground do we grow leafy green or do we produce flowers um, so a lot of times it's just kind of timing making sure from maybe it's the store um, when you buy them from the store, try to get them in the ground immediately, like that day. Okay, so cucumber plant bought from the store. Do they need to try to make sure it doesn't have any flowers on it? Or is there uh, something if, about that? I would actually pick off the flowers. Oh. Uh, so like if, if you have a flowering plant from the store, before I put it in the ground, I pick off all those flowers. So the plant's like, oh, where'd the flowers go? I guess we're not producing fruit right now. We need to focus on roots and we need to focus on leafy greens so that the greens are grown grown really leafy like you can see over here we'll walk right here these guys get really big so that they can take in energy to help the fruit because if you have something that's fruiting rooting and leafing at the same time it's not going to it can't multitask yeah if this won't be able to take in enough energy to root and fruit and grow bigger so you kind of want to uh, if something's already flowering, you don't get it because like, you're like, oh, that's cute. It's at uh, Walmart or it's at uh, BW Caps and it's flowering already. That's great. It's going to be easier because it's not. Um, so need, pick off the flowers, off the flowers, make it focus on the roots. Yep. When you put it in the ground, new soil, you want it to focus on rooting down in the soil. Um, so with um, phosphorus, is there anything or potassium? Is there something from the kitchen? I can just throw some banana peels in there uh, or? Yeah, actually there is. Uh, if you have a wood burning stove, uh, wood ash. Oh, so really or a fire hot. pit or something. Yeah, if you have a fire pit, uh, save your wood scraps because it's really high in potassium. Um, the farm I worked at, Jenny Jack, when we would uh, plant tomatoes, 
um, we would they had a wood burning stove and we would take they would save their wood ash all year long and before we put we would uh, make holes before we plant the tomatoes in we would put um, calcium magnesium uh, calcium carbonate and wood ash mm. and the wood ash is uh, really high in potassium it's going to give a good source for this plant to draw from of potassium because potassium makes the plant bloom. All right. Yeah. So tear off the flowers, put in some wood ash, and your cucumbers yeah. will be a little happier. Yeah. And okay. It, it really works well. Um, and uh, also, tomatoes need calcium as well. Uh, calcium is one of those really important nutrients uh, that helps the skin. Um, not tear. If, if you ever have tomatoes or cucumbers and it seems like the uh, the peel is split, a lot of times that's calcium deficiency. Um, and a lot of this is kind of technical. If, if so you, can I just mush up some egg, like some yeah, eggshells or something? Egg, eggshells. In good, good compost that you buy from um, a compost manufacturer. Uh, I buy ours from Farmers Organic down in Tipton. I buy it in bulk. But uh, they have um, the, they already have it set up so that it will all be uh, the right calcium, the right calcium will be uh, in that soil so it's ready to plant. So Patricia's watching mm -hmm. and she said she planted a tomato plant that she bought last week. So the, the plant, it kind of looks good. The stem's fine, but the leaves are completely all wilted off. So should she try to give them a chance to bounce back or should she trim off some leaves or? Yeah, uh, I would leave the leaves um, if they're wilting, plant it down to that root like we were talking about earlier um, and keep it really well watered. So if she didn't plant the tomato plant almost up to the top, is it worth it to try to plant it again? Uh, no, no, if it's already started rooting in, leave it, leave it as is. Maybe try to mound up a little bit of soil up uh, higher up the stem, not fully so you cover up any foliage or any leaves, um, but keep it really well watered uh, because a lot of times when you just plant that plant in the ground, the roots are only in a ball and they haven't spread out yet. So if you have water, um, it can only take in water from this area until it gets farther out um, and until you kind of have to baby it. So you have to keep watering it. Like I'm, I just planted peppers. Let's see. See, yeah, we can walk down here. I just planted peppers in the ground and I am hand watering each one of them every day because their root structures are so small. Are these the babies here? No, they're right up here. And you can look at these guys. Look at this right here. You can see these. These roots are really, really small. Um, so I've come and hand watered each of these just to make sure that they're getting good quality water And I'm coming in during the hottest parts of the day, even though it's better to water in the morning um, it, A lot of times you have to baby them throughout the day to make sure they're not burning through all that water uh, but if you keep them well watered um, and it, that, That's the hard part in Georgia in Columbus is uh, they, They'll burn through water and until you get that root structure spread out sprawling um, it can be really hard to keep things alive when they're babies. Okay, so you said the best time to water is the morning. Yeah, so when, because the plant, they have little pores on the leaves that open up um, to take in oxygen, but they don't want to do that in the hot of the day because then they evaporate water. So you want those pores to open up in the morning. Um, it's just better for the plant so it can not be stressed uh, from the heat of the day and it can focus on just taking up water in the morning and then it has this water for the rest of the day. So it really sounds like plants don't like to multitask. No, they don't. They like to have one task, do it, then and then the sun comes out, take in energy from the sun, sun's down, start growing at, in the afternoon and fruiting. Um, so yeah, it, that happens a lot. Awesome. Um, what else do we have to take a look at? Uh, so we have, let's take a look at the squash right here. So you can see these squash plants have just started fruiting. Um, so this is a yellowfin zucchini, actually. This will grow a good bit bigger. Um, this was the flower off of it, but that's a, just a small zucchini plant. Um, and so I'm, I have a bunch of 
potassium phosphorus that I planted when I planted these um, and now they're starting to take off the pest that I'm worried about with these is actually squa the squash bugs leaf footed squash bugs um, and I'm every every morning I come and talk to my plants and I, uh, I check them for any pests see what's happening with them do they look deficient um, in any way um, and I completely just giving them a check out we can look at this right here oh my goodness all right so talk to the plants I've yeah. heard of this but tell me more is this yeah. science or is this just passion uh, this is passion mojo um, good vibrations towards the plant whatever you want to call it uh, it's just good it's always good to check and be with your plants uh, I view them like a person um, if I don't talk to my friend for a year or for a week I'm gonna be not in tune to what they need uh, I think plants they may need trimming they need may need pruning they may need picking um, and if, if you like let them go too long without servicing their needs uh, it's not gonna be good so all right so what are our low our low maintenance plants low maintenance plants uh, you got your carrots you got your lettuce um, you have things like beans beans are kind of hard to pick all right let's see the beans yeah these are the beans these are the ones that really are awesome um, these are taken off these are called trilogy beans they're easy to grow unless you have deer pressure deer will demolish these um, they're easy to grow but the, they do take a while to pick they're really fun to pick um, squash is uh, easy to get started and grow uh, but it's hard to keep alive once the squash bugs hit them um, tomatoes are kind of the ones that everybody wants to grow tomatoes but they're kind of the hardest things to grow and get right. I feel so validated right now yeah. Because my tomatoes were not productive. I've heard so many people say, I tried to grow tomatoes, but I couldn't get them to work. I'm like, well, yeah, sometimes I can't get them to work. I've had a year where I was just like, man, well, man, gosh, this is so hard. Um, getting the tomatoes the right way takes uh, a lot of time, effort, and talking to the plants. But beans, you can put in the ground, and they'll, they're going to grow um, pretty easily. Same thing with carrots. Uh, you give them time and they'll grow. Uh, but if I was going to like just focus on one plant to do in the summer with ease, um, I wouldn't do peppers because peppers have a lot of blight. They need shade. They can't take full sun. A lot of the sweet peppers. I would do cucumbers um, and beans. Nice. And maybe squash. Uh, just know that if those squash bugs come for you, there's not much that you can do so we're up close and personal now and yeah, mary perfect. would like to see that mulch can you just point out to us what we're looking at yeah, here so we're looking at pine straw i didn't uh so i scraped it off that bed um and amended that bed right there um but on this one i planted right into it so i've had to water this a lot less because it the sun isn't baking the soil it's hitting this light grass and it's not actually baking the water out of it. Now, did you say that was pine straw? I'm sorry, this is a uh, hay. Hay, yeah, oh, this, good. This is hay. Uh, so I choose to use hay just because I can put more com When I finish harvesting these plants, I'll take them out cut, or cut them from the bottom and then put more soil right on top of this hay. And then I'll put hay on top of that. And I keep mounding compost hay, compost hay. And the soil just keeps getting richer with more carbon from the hay and then more nitrogen nutrients from the soil. So the hay is a type of compost slash mulch yeah. because it, it does dual purpose. Yeah. It's a carbon, it's a, it's a carbon additive to the soil and it keeps water retention and it uh, keeps weeds out. Uh, so cool. there's a lot less weeds. When you have something like this, you'll have to weed a lot less because that sunlight won't hit the, the weed seeds and help them germinate. You're gonna you're gonna shade a lot of weed seeds out. Nice. Yeah. So I, what yeah. else would you like us to see? And then before we finish, Gina wants to see your natural insecticides so she can see yeah, what yeah. the package looks like. Yeah, we can start walking back. Um, I'll talk to say that on a small scale, like what we do, um, we don't use any tractors. Uh, the form of agriculture that we do um, on a small scale is called minimal tillage. So we don't ever get a tiller and till up the soil. We leave the structure underneath the soil as it is because we never want to disturb 
uh, all those bacteria, all the uh, fungi that are underneath the soil in releasing, eating dead things, we leave them to stay. We just add more compost on top so that they have more room and more nutrients over and over and over again. A lot of times when you put a tractor to the soil and you turn over the soil, you're exposing those things to the sunlight, to the environment, and it'll kill off a lot of the good bacteria that's underneath the soil. Um, on a big scale, a lot of times you have to use a tractor or you can set the tractor to only like get a little bit of soil. Uh, but one of the best ways to get good, healthy soil is to keep planting a variety of plants, um, have animal manure uh, that you can keep adding on to it so nutrients keep seeping down into the soil and don't disturb the underneath soil um, because there are worms underneath there. There's really good life that's trying to help your plants grow and work in symbiotic unison. Okay, speaking of symbiosis, can we go see the nest real quick while we're on this yes, side? Yes, we can. All right, and you will be so proud of Patricia because she mounded up more soil around the base of her tomato plant, Juliet, and she gave the plant Juliet a pep talk as well. Good. So. Great job, I'm so proud of you. Yeah, keep getting, name it, give it some water, talk to it, be a friend. I know a lot of people can't see their friends, uh, but I promise you tomato plants can't have COVID. So. Oh, and Tony is um, complimenting the extraordinary fence. Yeah, Tony. Tony and Roger, I can't thank you enough. Thank you for building this fence for me. It looks great. All right, so let's see our biodiversity here. So, uh, Tell us more. Right here are little baby brown birds. Um, I don't know if you can see them. I don't want to get too close. Yeah. Um, but they're right in there. And that's that right there is uh, mom or dad bird that attacked oh, me yesterday. Oh boy. Daddy uh, bird is like, nope, not my babies. Yep, he's eyeing us down right now. Daddy bird's not happy. Yep, so we'll yield, yield to nature. But right in there, um, some awesome birds. And I can't say enough about uh, biodiversity is one of the main things that you want on your farm. Um, having lizards, ladybugs, uh, they'll eat pests. Uh, so we're talking about uh, aphids. If aphids are getting on your, on your um, kale or collards, if you have a good ladybug population, they're going to eat those aphids. Um, if you have squash bug, not squash bugs, but um, flies, hornworms, lizards will eat the flies that are trying to eat the roots of your plants. So biodiversity is one of the best ways to keep away pests as well. So, but let's go look at uh, that uh, in pesticide. Yeah, and while we're on the way, Patricia is very interested to know about I'm sorry, ma'am. She's interested in growing carrots in a container. So, any suggestions for growing carrots in a container? Yeah, so if you're growing carrots in a container, uh, make sure you have the right depth because the second that carrot sprouts, um, it's going to shoot a taproot straight down and it's going to shoot it fast. Um, and a lot of times, the your carrot will will dive down in one week that far um i'd give it at least a foot deep of soil if not more um so that you can have one of those uh really nice foot long carrots that everybody wants a big bulking carrot but it's going to dive down deep fast okay um so get, get that soil depth um and have have a looser soil if you have like a rocky soil a lot of times you'll get those really fun types of carrots they'll hit a rock and they'll split in two and then you'll have like the one of those carrots that are twisting around each other go three different directions somehow that just doesn't sound like something we do on purpose yeah so yeah make sure the soil is not rocky you have um well well kind of aerated soil um and uh, make sure you give it enough depth as well uh compost is really important so how big should the container be I mean, are we talking like it needs to be two foot deep of, yeah, I, a, of a safe, pot? I would give it a solid two, two, foot, um, two foot deep pot to grow carrots in. And you can just grow them in a foot, but that tap root's going to hit the bottom and you'll get eight, eight inch carrots instead of a really big carrot. Ah, there you go, Patricia. So if we want the big carrots, we got to use the big container. Yeah, so get, try and give it a foot and a half to two feet of, uh, of depth. 
Um, at, keep adding organic material to your plants. Um, you keep adding organic material because uh, I, I don't know if I've said this, but biodiversity. If, if you look at permaculture practices, uh, add more variety of animals that are going to poop and add more minerals to your plants that they can take up, make better fruit that we can eat. And it's just a cycle. So uh, keep adding compost and um, yeah. Cool. Let's take a look at that insecticide. Yeah. All right. So show and tell. Right here. So underneath the light, you can see these guys, this is Pyganics. It's, both of these are not chemicals, they're microorganisms. Um, so they're not like some type of poisonous chemical that you're going to pull on your plant. They're actually living things in here that change the acidity of like a worm's gut so it can't digest your food. Um, but this is, this is called BT. Um, it stands for Bacteriolose uh, throm Thrombosis. Um, and this is just Pyganics. And both uh, keep away flies, beetles. Uh, I usually use BT for more of my worms, like all my tomatoes. And I use Pyganics for beetles, like flea beetles that leave those bullet hole type holes in your uh, turnips. I'll spray some Pyganics. But like I said, this is does nothing to humans. There's no poison aspect. It just changes the acidity of the guts of these uh uh, worms and flies. Great. And I also use uh, nematodes, neem oil. I don't know if I have any. Let me look here. Yeah. So I also use, let me get into the light so people can read this. Uh, neem oil also helps. Um, it, it keeps off uh, a bunch of pests. Usually if I see squash bug uh, pressure, I'll spray them with this because it, it kind of halfway repels them, but yeah, I use neem oil as well. It's just a byproduct of nematodes. Yeah. Okay. So um, and it, also, right when you harvest your vegetables, especially your leafy greens, I harvest early in the morning, um, so that it's not hot outside. And right when I harvest them, I bring them into here, and we have a walk-in cooler, so that they're immediately cool. This is like kind of like a crisper um, with the containers that you have in your fridge. Try to get them in a dark, cool spot as soon as possible so that they stop breaking down. Um, and the heat won't break them down. The sunlight, ultraviolet rays won't break them down. But get them, like if you're harvesting kale or cucumbers, uh, tomatoes need to be in a, don't need to be in a cold environment, but they need to be in a dark environment. Um, so, that it, so they break down as slow as possible. And um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, let's head out to the porch. All right, Keith, so I feel like we should end with the strawberries, but if you yeah. want to real quick, just speak to um, the SOS nutrition part of this. So I think the thing is people are like, okay, here we are, mm -hmm. quarantine. I have been yeah. doing nothing but eating junk food. Like, what's the point? Yeah, a lot of times it can feel like, yeah, I ate one green with each meal, but it didn't do anything for me. Um, and I, I always want to stress, uh, I'm not going to tell anybody to do a crazy diet or um, to do anything that changes the way you eat entirely, but always try to eat more vegetables because that's what holds the nutrients, those small nutrients that give your immune system the things it needs to fight diseases um, and to fight, fight things so, uh, and to just stay healthy um, for your thyroid. Everything just comes from these plants. Um, good healthy proteins that your body knows how to deal with comes from plants. Uh, if you look at a cow, it only eats really grass, and yet it, it's one of the strongest animals you're ever gonna find um, because its body knows what to do with these plant materials, um, these, all these minerals that our body needs. So I, I just really wanna encourage everybody, when you do it for a while, your body kind of stops wanting these sugary things, your palate changes. Um, you, salt kind of doesn't uh it's a stronger taste because you're eating more vegetables and your palate changes and you just feel better um more energy it just takes a little while lauren has given us a shout out she said the best veggie she's had in years she got from mercy med farm that's really sweet thank you so much i appreciate that um, 
So on, hey, Calvin's back. So when we have our next opportunity, tell us when can we get some more Mercy Med vegetables? What are we gonna have? What should we do with them? So on, uh, on Friday, every Friday from here until October, November timeframe, we're gonna have Farm Stand Friday. Uh, it's what we started out doing. We're not doing the North Highland Farmer's Market um, because we have a food aggregator who's moving next door that will open up soon. I'll release information about that when we get it. Um, but somebody bringing in food will be next door to us. But every Friday, 9 to 12 a.m., you can come right to the front of Mercy Med Farm on 3rd Avenue and buy fresh produce that we harvest uh, Thursday. So tomorrow morning, me and uh, our intern, Emma Yancey, um, We'll come out here, harvest onions, uh, flowers that are edible. We'll harvest cucumber, squash, all that stuff, and have it for sale tomorrow. You can get carrots and radishes and turnips, all that stuff. So you're saying that if all I've done is eat ice cream for the past six weeks mm -hmm. and I eat one vegetable, it still counts? Oh, yeah, it counts. Every, every, every vegetable counts. I never want to uh, give someone insignificance or any vegetable insignificance because you're going to get good nutrition from that. Mm-hmm. Um, just little steps at a time. All right, let's go see some strawberries. All right, let's go see some strawberries. Awesome. So on Third Avenue, we need everybody to park on Third Avenue. They need to wear masks. Yeah, masks, and we'll have a uh, hand sanitizer. Um, the whole, the whole thing just to oh, keep everyone. There's safe. the veggie mobile. Yeah, this is the veggie bike I've been using to deliver our vegetables to people in our community. Um, yeah. What, how have they been doing with those vegetables? Have they told you anything they've been cooking with them yeah, or doing yeah, with them? I've, had some, I've, I've delivered a lot to new people each week and the same people each week. And there's been a lot of people just showing gratitude and thanks and just saying that they had loved the collards or the chard or whatever it is. Um, so so yeah. now what is this? What do we have here? This is a little flower patch. Something ate these nasturtiums. But this is a nasturtium flower. You see that? These are really good nasturtiums right here. You okay, nasturtiums. What do you do with them? Different colors. I put these in salads. What do they taste like? They're kind of peppery. They give a little peppery, uh, not really a spice, but... Peppery like arugula type peppery? Yeah, a peppery like arugula. Um, and then I have these other flowers, marigold, zinnia, that's about the flower. Ooh. These will be borage. I don't know if you uh, okay. Borage, really pretty flowers. And then these nasturtiums flowered early. Um, and I just harvested these strawberries this morning. Wow, to sell on Friday? Yeah, to sell on Friday. But these guys are really, uh, they're almost on the back end. Probably about two weeks ago, they were just pumping out strawberries. I had um, probably 100 pints that I gave out in one week. Um, <gasps> oh, wow. Like two or three weeks ago. But now they're kind of on the back end, and the blueberries are just starting to come in. So blueberries are on their way end of May um, when the strawberries are going out. But yeah, you can see these strawberries, they're awesome. Um, this is one that I missed this morning. Um, so we have strawberries, muscadines, we have figs, uh, blackberries, persimmons. When will the figs be um, the ready figs for harvest? In, uh, more August. Uh, end of July, August, and some varieties of figs will go, will produce in early October as well, but really around August time frame is when we'll get muscadines, figs, pears. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so quick recap. Mm -hmm. Let's say I have $50 and I have two hours a week. What what am I going to grow that I can eat? Um, I would, uh, if I was going to do that, I'd go get really good potting soil or compost, um, and I would plant carrots start off with carrots um and then for the summer start off with maybe a squash plant and a cucumber plant and baby it talk to it uh maybe talk to it for an hour and plant it for the other <laughs> hour. So, yeah one hour a week doing the work one hour a week enjoy. just making a friendship yeah. with the plant yep it's always important to to enjoy what you're what you've created and i guess just give give thanks to it for growing and produce, uh, supporting your body as well. I love it. Any closing thoughts? Anything else? Um, yeah, Got, just, and if Facebook world, anybody has any closing uh, questions? Yeah, let us know. Oh, hey, Lorna made coconut braised collars from the recipe card nice. she got from the farm. Hey, yeah. you got, do you have any recipe cards? Yeah, I have uh, that same recipe card. I'll, I'll make um, a few more recipe cards uh, in the next weeks. 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just keep putting out some more of our famous, favorite farm farm recipes. But yeah, that coconut braised collards is sublime. Mm. Um, it's just a different way to make collards that you're not using ham hock, but you're using vegetable broth, vegetable oil, um, that just keeps adding more good nutrients into your body. Nice. Um, yeah, but thank you for everybody who's come out. Um, uh, this farm is for everybody. If you want to have a picnic here with your family, you're always welcome. Um, the fence around it isn't to keep people out. It's always to make you feel nourished when you're in here, like you're in a garden space and you're, you're kind of cradled in. So we want everyone to feel at home here and that they can be a part of the Mercy Med Farm with us. All right, and we'll see everybody on Friday. Friday, 9, nine to 12. All right, thank you so much, Keith. Thank you all.